Hello and welcome to Happier, a podcast where we discuss cutting edge science, the wisdom of the ages, lessons from pop culture, and our own experiences about how to be happier. This week, we'll talk about why we should stop fubbing people, and we will share listeners' strategies for getting rid of clutter and taking medication regularly. I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, good habits, human nature, the five senses, I'm in my little home office here in New York City, and joining me today from LA is my sister Elizabeth Kraft. And Elizabeth, our trip to Kansas City is just about here. That's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in LA. And yes, Gretch, I have my boarding pass. Oh, good. In hand, yes, I am ready to get on that plane. Okay, I got an, I got a couple more hours before mine is going to show up, but I cannot okay. wait. Neither can I. Gretchen, before we get started, we wanted to send um, all of our good wishes to everybody in Puerto Rico yes. who's um, suffering the effects of Hurricane Fiona. Um, you know, I spend time in Puerto Rico, Gretch, shooting Fantasy Island. So, of course, I know lots of people and I love Puerto Rico. So hope that they're getting along OK. Yeah. Yeah, good wishes to everyone there. And I also wanted to let everybody know, so I have my Four Tendencies gift box now. And um, what's funny is that when I looked at, when they went on sale, it was lots of obligers, <laughs> a few upholders, one questioner and no rebels, which I thought was quite funny because it's sort of like exactly what you might have thought. Yes. But if you're interested in one of these, either for yourself or for somebody else who doesn't love a gift box, there's a mug and a sticker for your tendency or for whatever tendency you're choosing. There's the tackle box, which is the sticky pad that has all the different sticky pads that can appeal to all the different tendencies. And then there's this new companion guide that I did that it has interviews with people about their tendencies and it's 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 got kind of journal prompts for you to think about know yourself better so i'm really excited about it i did it for the fifth anniversary of the four tendencies and i'm really pleased with how it turned out and if you want you can choose or not to have a copy of the book with it because i figured some people would want the book but some people pro probably already had the book but if you're curious you want to learn more go to happiercast.com slash 4t collection and that's the number for the letter t collection and there you will find a way to celebrate your tendency or somebody else's tendency. Yes, I would think people would get it for rebels in their lives. I would, I would, it's a good gift for a rebel, is what I would imagine. And a lot of rebels really pride themselves on being yes. rebels. So, yes. yeah. And maybe you didn't even know what you were. Somebody knows what you are, and it's like, here, yes. let me show you something <laughs> about yourself. Yeah, it'd be fun. Oh, and, and speaking of the tendencies, you know, we've been doing this tendency spotting, like hashtag tendency spotting on social media. Now, some of these I don't know because I haven't watched all these shows. Mm. Elizabeth, you've watched Shit's Creek, right? Uh, yes, some of it. So I've heard that Alexis Ro Rose is an obliger. Ah, uh, uh-huh. That, that tracks. And then somebody posted that from Disney Sleeping Beauty that Flora is an upholder. Fauna is an obliger, and Meriwether is a rebel. I do not remember my Disney <laughs> yeah. well enough. I love Monsters, Inc. I have I watched it like a thousand times when Eliza and Eleanor were little. I haven't seen it in a while, but someone said that Mike Wazowski is an obliger, and as far as I can recall, I think that tracks. Yeah. And then in the office, Dwight Schrute is an upholder. Uh, Detail-oriented and thrives under rules. Definitely that that makes sense to me. Yeah, and Angela's an upholder too. So you see mm. those two getting together. Yeah, I have a whole thing about the, I can do all the characters in the office, which I won't get into now, but yeah, yeah there's a lot of tendencies. Mike Scher, who, who uh, was a writer on The Office, is an upholder, as we yes. found out when we talked to him. Encanto, which I have not seen. Me neither. Uh, they say Bruno Madrigal is an obliger who snaps and rebels in just about the most introverted way possible. That's so, funny. Yeah. Now I want to see. Now I want to see it. Now people have been posting about House of the Dragon, but listen, you and I have been watching House of the Dragon. I don't think you can tell people's mm. tendencies yet. There's a yes. few that you might be able to tell, but I still feel like we don't know these characters. We haven't seen enough of their actions and also understood their thinking well enough yet. So I'm 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 staying tuned for House of the Dragon. Yes, I think you're right. So if you have other characters you want to propose, put it on in that social media and hashtag tendency spotting because I am keeping a giant compendium of these. I love them. Yes. 
So this week, our try this at home tip is to stop fubbing people. Okay, explain what that is, Gretchen. I think you should spell it too. Yes, clarity. it's fubbing, P H U B B I N G. So it's phone snubbing. So if you're hmm. phone snubbing person, you're fubbing them. So this is when you're in a social situation and instead of paying attention to the person that you're talking to, you're checking your phone. And this is very common, like 90% of adults say they do this. Yes, Gretchen, safe to say, I mean, the vast majority yes. of us do this. Yes. So yes. why is it bad? Why do we need to stop? So they did research on this and what they found is that when people were asked to rate an interaction, they found it less enjoyable and they had reduced feelings of connection and engagement if someone was using a phone. Like it, it, it led to them feeling more excluded, more ignored. But here's the really fascinating thing. This is only when the other person was using the phone. If, if mm. we're having it and you're using your phone, I, I'm rating that interaction lower. But for you, you don't realize it. When mm. people think of their own phone use, they significantly underestimated the negative effect it had. So they the researchers call this the fubbing blind spot. <laughs> we feel it, but we don't realize that we do the same thing to other people. There's a disconnect there. Well, Gretchen, it reminds me of something we talked about a long time ago about the research on teasing. Yes. Because people who were doing the teasing thought it was playful and warm and, I mean, really a connective thing. Yes. And the people who were being teased felt it was more malicious and annoying. Yeah. So it, there was a disconnect. Right. And so sometimes we just have to be aware that, like, just because it seems okay to us, we have to think, well, how is it striking someone else? And, and the reason for the disconnect is when we're using our own phone, we think we're adding more value than we are. Like, oh, I'm going to take a minute and look up that movie title or I'll, I'll look up that date and that will add to the conversation. But really taking you out of the conversation maybe is it doesn't outweigh that. Mm -hmm. Also, and I mean, we've all experienced this. People overestimate their ability to multitask. People think like, oh, I can check my texts and keep talking to you. But in fact, they're pausing they have to be caught up. Yes. They, they think that they're not being disruptive, but actually their disengagement is disruptive. Yes. Yeah. You're just not into the conversation. Yeah. You're just not picking up. And then another thing, you know, because I'm writing this book about the five senses, I've done a lot of research on, on eye contact and gaze. In gaze, it's, it's powerful. It's complex. There's all kinds of communication and signaling that happens through the how we use our eyes, you know, for most of us. And in fact, it's so powerful. That's why some people really don't want to make eye contact because it does have this such such a charge. Mm. And when you're looking at your phone, you're not making eye contact. And so maybe that gives me the feeling like I, I'm not holding your attention. You're you're not really paying attention to me because we're not having that exchange. I do think there are a lot of people who use their phone as a way to handle social anxiety, yes. right? Yeah. For sure, Adam is one of those people. He has social anxiety and looking at the phone really helps. Or maybe there's a conflict and people are trying to calm themselves in a, in a mm. moment where it's like a lot of heightened emotion. And so they'll do it to kind of disengage. So, I mean, I think it is important to be aware that that can be an aspect of the dynamic to take into account as you're thinking through it. But it's just to be aware of everything that's going on, not just your own perspective. Gretchen, we are that family where we'd be at a restaurant and you could look over and all three of us would be looking at our phones. And the other day <laughs> we were out and I said to Jack and Adam, on Happier, we talked about a listener suggested that if it's not a situation where you would pull out a novel and start reading, <laughs> then you should yeah. not pull out your phone yes. and start yes. looking at your phone. Remember yeah. we discussed that? Yeah. And they were just adamant that that wasn't the case. They were like, mm. that's not the same thing. Like, ah. it's absolutely acceptable to pull out your phone. That's where we are in, in society. Uh, and and we disagree. And it would be ruder to pull out your, a novel. Oh. So they weren't having that. But nonetheless, we are trying to talk to each other at dinner, at least for a good portion of it. Right. Right. But right. it does involve everyone has to put down their phone because so often we'll say, Jack, put away your phone. And he'll say, but dad has his phone or mom's yeah. checking her text. So, yeah. you know, guilty. Yeah. Well, so let's say you do want to work on it and you're the fubber. 
You know, you're just like, I can't rest unless I look up that movie title or whatever. So here are some things to think about. One thing is that the research suggests that you can improve the situation and like help people not feel as excluded if you explain what you're doing. If you're like, hey, look, I'm waiting for this urgent text from Sarah about right. you know when this meeting is, so I'm just going to keep checking it. And then people are like, oh, that's what's going on. Yes. Or if you say to somebody like, well, wait, can you hold that thought for a minute? Because I simply can't continue until like I solve this mystery for myself. Let me look this up. So that people know they're like, okay, I have your attention and we're going to pause so that you can take care of this task. And then we're going to re-engage. And then, Gretch, you can always use the strategy of inconvenience, yeah. which is one of your most powerful <laughs> yeah. tools where you just make the phone hard to get to. Yes. So this is one of the strategies from Better Than Before, my book about habit change. So it's if you're like, look, for this this meal, we're absolutely not going to use our phones. Leave your phones in the car yes. because then nobody can check their phone. Because when you're relying on willpower, iffy. It's iffy. Yeah. Or, or at least like maybe put your phone in your backpack or your purse or whatever, zip it up, put it out of reach. So it's not just like right in your back pocket. It is funny because it's that whole perception thing. Like Adam thinks I'm on my phone way yeah. more than he's on his. And I am like, are you kidding? You're on your phone way more than I'm on my phone. And we're both 100% convinced we're right and that it's glaringly obvious. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect example of you think when other people do it, it's more disruptive than when you're doing it. That's a perfect example. So here's another thing what to do if like someone's phone snubbing you is Mm. one thing you can do. And and we talked about a related strategy about the person who kept getting interrupted is that if somebody's doing that, stop talking. And then if, they, if they're like, what's going on, then you just say like, I'll wait for you to finish. Mm. Or, you know, if you need to deal with something, go ahead. And so it's this idea that things aren't continuing. They're being interrupted. So you make that clear by not continuing the conversation. That's a great method. So let us know if you do try this at home and whether you've managed to stop fubbing people or what you do when someone fubs you or how to think about this, because we've all done it. We've all had it done to us. It's a fact of everyday life, I think, yeah. now. Let us know on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Drop us an email at podcast at GretchenRubin.com. Or as always, you can go to the show notes. Go to happiercast.com slash 397 for everything related to this episode. Coming up, we've got a happiness hack that is a perfect tool for something. But first, this break. Okay, Elizabeth, for this happiness hack, um, before you you share from our listener, I think we need to give some background information because neither you nor I was like, I don't know what a comb binder is. Do you know what a comb binder is? And we were like, no, we do not know what a comb binder is. Okay, a comb binder is a device that will take pages and make them into those booklets that have the spiral plastic rings binding. So it's not like a three ring binder. It's one of those ones that has the whole spine of plastic rings. That's yes. So the, the device that does that is a comb binder. It's binding it together in that comb. Yes. So now that we know that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. It's yeah, going to be a comb <laughs> binder related yeah. hack. <laughs> now that we know that, Caitlin says, I bought myself a comb binder online and have found that it is a happiness booster when it comes to documents. I occasionally find myself wanting to print ebooks, reference documents, or anything that might just be more readable as a printout I might turn to again and again. The comb binder for these documents is fabulous. It creates a more substantial item than a plain stapler, keeps the pages together in a way that a folder can't, and takes up less space and feels more friendly in hand than a three-ring binder. I spent about $60 on the machine, but now see endless possibilities for it. I can imagine binding kids' projects or important school information, personal information like the Facts of Life binder, copies of travel documents, and more. I didn't know you could do this at home. I thought you had to go to Kinko's to have this done. Yes, it's in the same category as people whose lives are changed by laminators. Yes. Many people are huge believers in home laminating. Yes, yes. So I was thinking about all the things that I might do with a comb binder. And I was thinking, if you're in that stage of life where it's always like, how do we give a gift for a teacher where we're not supposed to spend a lot of money, we want to do something thoughtful, I could imagine doing something like, which is like a collection of drawings for a teacher or recipes. Each child has their favorite recipe and then you bind it together and then it's like, you know, a little thing. 
or maybe you're renting out your house or, or, or you have frequent guests and you want to have something with, which is like, how to use the laundry machine? What's the Wi-Fi password? Yes. What are some restaurants that are nearby? And you want to just have it like neat and organized and that will stay together. Yes. Or um, if there's any sort of workbook yeah. situation, yeah. probably especially at work, if you yeah. have to do something that's like a workbook. Yeah, I mean, anything with a lot of documents that you want to keep track of. I mean, I did this for fun when Eliza and Eleanor were small. I made a book like this, but I went to Kinko's yeah. to get it made. Like, I, it never occurred to me that I could just do that. So I think I think it's the kind of thing that for some people, there'd be a lot of ways to Doing the Facts of Life book is a great idea. Yes. And I think now so many things aren't printed, yeah. which is good. But there are things that do need to be printed. And yeah. this is, as Caitlin said, a way to keep it together yeah. and a way that's easy to access and easy to store. Yeah. I've got a million three ring binders around. I got them in every size. And they take up a lot of room. They do take up a, a lot, lot of room. more room than this would. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So that's great. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes. And now for a four tendencies tip. Okay, we have two tips. One is from an obliger who came up with an unconventional way to create accountability for clearing her house. And one from a rebel about how a rebel can figure out sticking to demanding health requirements, which mm. is something I've heard from a lot of rebels. This can be tricky. Okay. Okay, Gretchen's first tip comes from an obliger and we're making it anonymous and changing some names and details to protect her privacy. She says, I am an obliger and a clutter bug who struggles with getting rid of anything sentimental, anything that was given to me and things that I might possibly need one day, even if I've never used it. Thankfully, my questioner husband is very patient with me as I try to cut down on the clutter. In Outer Order, Inner Calm, Gretch, that's one of your books. Yes, that's one my book. of the brilliant <laughs> suggestions you make is to identify a charity or specific place for our donations to go to give us more motivation to get rid of things we don't need. Ding, 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 I found it. I work with someone whose son has been a drug addict for the majority of his life. I have been struggling with the compassion of wanting to help him, but also with anger from what he has put his family through. He is now in a new rehab center, but the special thing about this one is that everyone who is in the program works in a thrift store in order to pay for their rehabilitation. So while I am trying to declutter my home, I have been filling up boxes labeled Ryan's Sobriety. I have convinced myself that every item I donate to the thrift store will help him somehow. I can honestly say I've never gotten rid of so many things. As an obliger, it makes it so much easier to get rid of clutter knowing that it makes my husband happy, helps my coworker's son with his sobriety, and makes our home more inviting for guests and entertaining. It has also been therapeutic for me as an added bonus. Well, this is such this is a wonderful example of where she's helping someone else. She's clearing clutter. And she's figured out a way to connect those things in a way that's giving her the accountability that is just really helping her to achieve her aim for herself. Yes. So, such an ingenious accountability system. Yes. Wonderful. And then, Gretchen, we heard from Rebecca, who's a rebel. She says, hello, I'm a rebel and had such a classic moment years ago I wanted to share. I have been a very healthy person all my life who chooses a healthy lifestyle so I could stay that way. Then I got sick, very, very sick. Luckily, I was able to be cured, but the cure left me with a lifelong deficiency. I have to take medication every day. The first few weeks after starting my medication were difficult. I had to take this medication three times over 24 hours, including the middle of the night. Mm. My husband is an upholder, quasi-questioner, so wanted to keep track of my medication and was adamant about reminders and checking in on me all day long. If I wasn't feeling well, I would have to take extra meds. He was obviously worried. Besides the medication, I had to start wearing a Meta Alert bracelet. About two weeks into all this, I had a meltdown. I threw the bracelet on the floor and told my medication bottle, no. Luckily, I was alone. I realized I better figure this out immediately. I had a revelation that I didn't have to do anything. No one was forcing me at gunpoint to take my meds and wear the stupid bracelet. I could theoretically do nothing, go back to the couch and read my book, but there would be consequences. 
I forced myself to visualize in excruciating details the scenario of not taking my medication. It would quickly become a painful and frightening experience, leading to death in about three to four days, especially since no bracelet would mean medical staff wouldn't know how to help me. I completed this with how my loved ones would feel, especially my children. I took the meds and put the bracelet back on. Annoyingly, I had to do this about once a month for that first year, each time adding more horrible details to my consequences scenario. Five years later, I am proud to be a healthy person who also takes medication and I have some very cool looking bracelets. I love this. This is a rebel using information consequences choice. This is something many, many people of all tendencies struggle with, but I've heard this yes. from rebels too. They don't like that feeling of having to do something, feeling kind of trapped by that, being told they have to do what the doctor tells them. But Rebecca found a way to harness that rebel strength to get it done. This is her choice. This is what she wants. This is great. Yes. Excellent, Rebecca. And I know being diabetic and having to take insulin all day, and I know how it can be a struggle even for an obliger like me. So I yeah. can only imagine how hard it is for rebels. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Okay, Gretchen, coming up, I am giving myself a big gold star related to my summer of health. But first, this break. Okay, Gretchen, it is time for demerits and gold stars, and you are up this week with a happiness demerit. Okay, so my demerit is something like, I should know better. I, of all people, should know better. Oh, okay, oh. so Eleanor's a senior in high school, and she was working mm -hmm. on an essay, and she'd been working and working, and she showed it to me and was like, okay, you know, what do you think? And, you know, it was really good. There were a lot of parts that were really good. But, of course, I was like, I thought her chronology was confusing. Like, there was a lot of going back and forth and everything. So I go running to her, and I was like, I think it's confusing, the chronology. I think you could simplify it a lot mm. just but you know, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't do the thing with the soft lead-in and pointing out all the things that I liked. And I, I think I was just like, ooh, easy fix. Just rearrange things. And she did not like me coming on so strong. She'd already done a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I think, Elizabeth, you and I know the feeling. Of, you think, oh, I worked on this so hard. I'm going to show it to somebody and they're going to be like, this is awesome. You're done. Don't yes. change a word. It is perfect. And they never say that. Nobody yes. ever has never. ever in the history of the world said that. No. But I just know better. I know you go in gently. You point out all the things that are strong. You help people see what is confusing to you mm -hmm. instead of going right to it. And in the end, she was sort of like, well, I'll take this under advisement. Uh -huh. and so <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know what she's going to do. Well, as we know, Gretchen, you need time also. You do. You need time to process thoughts. And I yes. mean, how many times have, have we gotten notes and, and been stomping around and angry and upset and then like a day later it's like oh i get it yeah okay oh, that's fine. i actually tell people that i'm working with that i'm like you will tell me to do something and i will say no that can't be done <laughs> and then 20 minutes later i'll be like yeah i can do it yeah and I, and I know that i do that and you think well if you know that you do it just stop doing it but i can't stop i uh, we all do it so i and i said to eleanor I'm sorry. I was excited by all the ideas here. I think it's great. I just saw this place, which to me seemed like an, an easy fix. And I was all excited about talking about it, but I did it totally wrong. And she was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, of course, um, would love to read that essay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alyssa, okay. Gold star. What's your gold star? Okay, Gretch, I am giving myself a gold star. You remember I had my summer of health. Oh, now yeah. we're getting into fall, but this came about during my summer of health, which is that I, a couple of days ago, got a colonoscopy and an endoscopy. This is like a shower of gold stars. Yes. In a single day. Yes, in a single day. They did the both procedures at the same time, which was great. And as everyone says, the colonoscopy is not as bad as anticipated. I couldn't eat the day before. It was a clear liquid diet. And that truly was, for me, the hardest part of the whole thing. But I feel so relieved. You know, I was very motivated because one of the Satellite Sisters, you know, we love the Satellite yeah. Sister podcast. One of the Satellite Sisters, a friend of hers had just nagged and nagged, nagged her to get her colonoscopy routine, and she ended up having cancer. 
very early stage and it was fine. completely fine because that's a very, so I just said, you know what, let me do it. Right. I did it. And then an endoscopy I also needed. And so yeah. I just feel so good that yeah. I followed through. Yes. I mean, those have been on your list for a while and now you yeah. get the big cross off. And Alyssa, you get an even extra gold star because inspired by this. So I didn't do anything as ambitious and as and big as that. But I was like, if Elizabeth can do both these things in one day, I'm like, I've got to get, I'm going to get my vaccines. So I've been meaning to get my flu shot and my booster. And I'm like, let me just inspired by Elizabeth. Let me go do this. And I made my appointment, went in, got one on one arm, one on the other arm. And, you know, I, I never get side effects from vaccines. I'm super lucky in that way. But again, just getting that thing crossed off your list. You yes. just feel good knowing that you're tackling these things as they come yes. up. Yes, yeah. getting my new COVID booster is next on my list, Scratch. I did get the flu shot. But well, I, you inspired I my... me, so oh, thank good. you. Good. The resources for this week. All month long in the Happier Act, we've been featuring content designed to help you build self-knowledge and put it to use. And there you'll find four tendencies related audio clips, tips, five-minute challenges, and more. So head to thehappierapp.com and you can learn more and download the app. Of course, I'll put links in the show notes. And also in episode 324, we celebrated the wisdom of teachers with a collection of proverbs of the professions. So there is a free PDF uh, with great insights there. So you can download it, share with a teacher in your life. And if you go to GretchenRubin.com slash resources and look under podcast resources. And what are we reading? Elizabeth, what are you reading? I'm reading The Nest by Cynthia Dupree Sweeney. And I am rereading My Name is Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Strout. And that's it for this episode of Happier. Remember to try this at home. Stop fubbing people. <laughs> Let us know if you tried it and if it worked for you. Thank you to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Canes 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Twitter at Gretchen Rubin, and I'm at Elizabeth Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And if you like the show, now do not do this if you're going to fub someone. Do not do this in the middle of an animated conversation with a friend. But if you're just walking down the street, you're standing in a line at the drugstore, please email or text the link to this episode to a friend who you think would enjoy the show. Word of mouth is how most people discover our show. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Kraft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thanks for joining us. Onward and upward. Gretchen, I had a moment of panic because I couldn't find my plane ticket for tomorrow. Oh. oh. And I thought I had actually forgotten to buy it, but oh, it turns out I had yes. given them the wrong email address. So oh. all is well. Oh, I, man. I, I know people. It's like you get halfway through and you forget to actually hit purchase. Yes. I Ooh. thought that had happened, Ooh, but good. all all is well. Okay. Thanks for watching the show here on YouTube. If you like the show, please click subscribe right under the video. It really helps other people to discover our show. From the Onward Project.